Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to JBDC's virtual Biz Zone. A very special welcome to our first time participants. My name is Dania Bennett, your host for the afternoon session. And this time slot is facilitated by the JBDC's Technical Services Department, responsible for assisting clients of the JBDC with our product development needs. So you help them from concept to market. So over the last couple of weeks, we have been covering some excellent topics and we have been assisting persons in thinking about what they need to um, pursue for product development regarding their manufacturing practices and so much more. And today our topic is just as interesting and exciting and we also have a very special guest for you today. And um, just to point out, if you missed any of those webinars that we had before, don't forget that you can access them via our YouTube page, JBDC Jamaica. So head on over there and check them out and get wind of some of the excellent content that we have actually put forward over um, the time period since COVID has actually, you know, limited our interaction with our clients. So we have been actually working to assist you just the same. All right, this week we will be looking at using design thinking for successful product development. And our very special guest this week is none other than Mr. Colin Porter, manager of the technical services department. So that's right. We have one of our head honchos here today who is actually responsible for the technical services department. So he has an extensive um, accolade and experience as it pertains to manufacturing and product development. So I'm just going to jump into that a little bit. He is an innovative professional with close to three decades of proven experience in manufacturing, logistics, product development, and excellent organizing skills. He has a BSc in Industrial Engineering from the UWI, the University of the West Indies, and he's an active member of the Jamaica Institution of Engineers, where he formerly served as Vice President. He's also a board member and registered engineer with the Professional Engineers Registration Board. He is also a part-time lecturer of the Enamani College of the Visual and Performing Arts, where he teaches them about product design. He is also a member of the Industrial Engineering Advisory Committee from the University of Technology. And last but certainly not least, an avid photographer and visual designer. So as I said, his resume is quite extensive and he is very, very, you know, prepared to deal with this topic today. He has, um, the necessary background to assist you all. So as I said, we'll be looking at how design thinking can assist product development. And just to let you know, before we jump into Mr. Porter's presentation, that we generally facilitate questions at the end of the presentation. So at that time, you can type a question in the chat, or you can click on the icon indicating that you want to raise your hand and you will be acknowledged at that time. So without any further ado, Mr. Colin Porter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dania, and good afternoon to everyone. I see some familiar names. I was about to say familiar faces, but welcome to all the familiar names I'm seeing. Hi, Ingrid, long time no see. Um, Auntie Faye, whole bunch of people. I'm not single out people and allow the others to get jealous now. So I'm going to start sharing my screen um, with you guys now. And today we're touching on an era which is relatively new in the world of design. However, this is a concept that goes beyond design in the traditional sense. It has been around since the 1980s really and the beautiful thing about design thinking is that it's more about thinking and doing as opposed to just designing. So we're going to start with a very famous and prominent icon in the world of design who 
coincidentally was not a designer himself. And this statement is attributed to him. Design is not just what it looks like and feels like. Design is how it works. So Steve Jobs, as you know, headed Apple for a very long time from its inception in 1977. And Apple is famous for their designs. But you'll notice one, one of the key features about Apple, a lot of Apple designs is the simplicity, right? So they focus a lot on the function, how it works. So design is really about how do we get something to work, right? How, how can it satisfy a need? And so we're gonna be dwell, um, kind of delving into that a bit today and see how the philosophy of design thinking um, assists with that. So what is design thinking? It is defined as a philosophy which is human-centered. Some people may say user-centered, um, user-centric, and collaborative. It is a human-centered and collaborative approach to design, to problem solving rather. And importantly, it is about being creative, iterative, and practical. And this is a statement attributed to um, Tim Brown, who is a CEO of one of the leading design companies in the world, a company called IDEO. And they are responsible for designing a lot of products that we interact with every day. But most importantly, they have been, they have been at the forefront of showing that design thinking is not just about designing tangible items, but it's a process that can provide solutions to just about any area of life. So let us look a little bit, however, at the difference between design thinking and functional design. And I want to start out by saying that design thinking as an approach does not replace the other um, more popular and known areas of design. So an architect still has to design using the, the tools and principles of architecture. The visual designer or the graphic designer still uses their basic principles and so on. However, what design thinking helps us to do is to approach design from a different point of view. And this slide here illustrates the, 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 the general process and the key areas of design thinking, which makes it unique, which makes it something with a lot of impact. You start by empathizing. You have empathy is something you will hear a lot about when person speak about designing or use, use design thinking. Put yourself in the, in, 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 the, in the space of who you're designing for. Then you want to define the problem. So you empathize with the people who we are designing for. You want to define what the problem is. Design is about finding a solution. Ideas, you want to come up with ideas. You want to come up with solutions of how you can tackle that problem or you can find a solution which will satisfy the need of the people you're designing for. Of course, prototyping is about testing your ideas, testing your concept. Does it work? Does it satisfy the needs? Um, have I really tackled the problem? And then from prototype, you test it in a real life situation. Are people satisfied? Are people finding real solutions from um, what I have presented. And this process is very iterative, meaning that you keep going back depending on the answers you get. It's not linear. It is a very interactive, iterative process. And it may, depending on what problem you're trying to solve, it may, um, the, the time may vary quite a bit. So the key elements, as I mentioned, we started by saying it is people-centered, highly creative, hands-on, and iterative. And, and we'll get into these eras, um, these key elements of design thinking. So when we speak about um, design thinking being people-centered, we generally in design rely a lot on marketing information. We need a lot of demographic information. We need a lot of information about the industry that we're serving and, and the consumers we're targeting and so on. 
The difference with design thinking is that it goes a little bit deeper than that. So you literally want to find out what individual persons are thinking, what motivates them, what problems are they trying to solve. Um, sometimes it's not even a, they may not be able to articulate the problem to you, but you may look and realize that you know people have a challenge in a particular area. And you as a designer may solve, may, may, may identify the problem yourself. But what is critical about this element is that empathy is key. So it's not about you, the designer, right? It is about what others are um, doing, what how others are functioning, how they are operating. So you take it away from yourself. A lot of times, um, speaking from a tangible design or product design point of view, one mistake that some designers make, we as designers make, is that we design something for ourselves. And when it gets into the hand of the, the user, the person who will use it, if you are not there to explain how the thing functions, how it works, then they don't understand it, right? So design thinking is about doing that in the reverse, taking yourself out of the picture as an individual and putting others in there. How will it function um, and will it satisfy their particular needs? The other element is that it is highly creative. And you say, but uh, that's axiomatic. If you're designing, you must be creative. But creativity here now speaks at looking at situations differently and going towards solutions that may not be very obvious, right? It's about thinking outside the box. It is about using concepts um, in, in, in design thinking where they speak about divergence and convergent thinking. Con you want to be more convergent where you have wild ideas and later on we'll speak about brainstorming and so on as an approach. But you want to be as open as possible to look at different aspects of the problem that you're trying to solve or the problem you're trying to identify and look at different approaches um, for solutions and not just settle on, okay, this is what I thought of first, so this will be the road I take, but to look at different perspectives. Design thinking is about being hands-on, right? And it is about making your ideas tangible. And I'll pause right now and say that design thinking as, as a um, process, and even though I may be biased towards um, speaking about um, tangible products today, it is a process that can be applied to just about any situation. If you look at design in the broadest sense, we can design a process to um, how do you, 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 you um, process clients in a bank, for example. You have to design that process. Um, how does a hospital um, handle patients who, who come into the emergency room for, 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 for attention. That is a process that can be designed. And these processes as well have prototypes, can have prototypes which can be tested, right? And later on, we, we, we'll go into that as well. But a key feature of being hands-on is that you have to embrace failure not be dejected because the first time you put your prototype together and it did not work, you thought, okay, my idea is foolishness, I give up, I can't bother. Or someone else looks at you and says, boy, you think never work, you know. Think you say a designer, that don't make no sense. But the fact is that we need to embrace failure and learn from these errors. Trial and error um, is, 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 is something that is embraced. A lot of the world's greatest inventions um, will you, you'll be told that th these were discovered through trial and error and they were actually designed to perform one function but end up performing a totally different function even better. So failure is something that um, you should embrace but you should not rest on failure but to be able to dissect um, failure and learn from that to end up with a more workable solution. And as we say, the, the process is iterative. Go beyond that initial solution. 
and you go through the cycle of understand, create, learn, right? So you understand what the, the, the problem is that you're trying to find a solution for. You create what you think is a solution. Then you learn from any shortcomings that solution may have, right? And this will lead to um, a better chance of getting better results. And I should point out as well, before moving to the next slide, that there are other philosoph philosophies out there that um, entrepreneurs are using now. Lean Startup, for example, is one big one. And one of the key things about Lean Startup, it says you don't have to have the most perfect product to go to market, your minimum viable product. You want it to have the basic functions, and as you go, you add more features to it. That's not incongruent with what this is saying here. So we're not saying that you have to have the perfect product before you go to market. And we see that a lot with, with our apps. Every day your phone, you, you have your app, it said um, you need to download and upgrade, right? So the word upgrade has become so common and so ingrained in, in, in our vocabulary now that it is because the designers have realized that I have a basic working product I will put it out there to, to the market. Consumers will use it. Based on their feedback, I will improve it. So this iterative process can go on and on. And it's the same. We see it in automobiles. Every, every model year, which is about every three to five years, new models come out with new features. Fashion changes, right? So it is something that is really applied in everyday design and everyday products that we see. So as designers, we should learn to look at all things and be able to iterate and come up with better solutions as we go. So going back over the process, now I've been doing a lot of repetition to get the information to you. So um, I'm doing this purposely. So this is the flow, empathize. So you're learning about the audience for whom you're designing. You want to create um, they're look, look at from their point of view, what are their needs and insights? So you, you're defining the problem at this point. And as I mentioned, sometimes you may have to define a problem, which is not very apparent. People may not know that they have a particular problem, but you, from your um, point of empathy, you realize that, you know, they could use my item to, um, you know, alleviate this issue that they're having that they're not even recognizing. And the idea stage, as I mentioned, which is about brainstorming, and you're coming up with many well, um, and, and, and crazy ideas, and we'll get into that some more. And prototype, which I just mentioned, and testing, which is where you share your idea to get feedback and look at what worked, what didn't work, how can I improve it, and so on. So, and as I mentioned, this process at each stage of the game, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but if you're at the idea stage and you realize that you need more information to have a more robust brainstorming or ideation session, you may need to go back to, um, to define the problem, right? But you may not have enough information. So you go back and empathize and put yourself back in the shoes and you learn some more about your audience in order that you can move on to the next step. So each step of the way, you are allowed to go backwards, even at the point of testing, because if your test didn't work, obviously you need to go back and find what your um, area of shortcoming or your bottleneck was in order for you to move ahead. Right, so we see the loop here, I'm just showing from the end to the start, but it may happen at any point throughout the process. So this is a chart from, um, uh, Damian Newman, who is from what, um, one of the leading design companies as well. And this is typically how design, the, the, the process or the, 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 the flow of design tends to work. You always start from a point of uncertainty, um, trying to identify patterns and glean insights. And normally that happens through research, where you're, you're going through a lot of information and trying to figure out um, what is it that people want? What, what solution am I um, providing? What problem am I tackling? Um, what do people want? What do they like? Who, who do I target? Who do I focus on? So it appears very chaotic at this point. As you go through and you do your research and you get information, 
to the point where you can define the problem and ideate and you create your concept prototype. This line kind of starts to smoothen out a little bit, get a little bit easier. And there is some clarity and focus now that leads you into the actual design process. And at this point now, the architect, the, the jewelry designer, the shoe designer, the fashion designer, or the process designer will be in a better position now to design the specific item, have the particular features which will allow your product to function um, with your demographic, with the people you're designing for, within the area that you're designing for. So this kind of illustrates and maps out what goes through the whole process of coming up with um, a workable solution. So when do we use design thinking? Um, it may sound like, okay, yeah, this is something I need to use all the while and every day. And really and truly you can use the, the process of design thinking in your everyday life. This is something you can use in your personal um, areas. You don't have to be designing for commercial purposes or to solve a big problem in the world or anything. You can literally use it every day. But let us look at some specifics when design thinking tend to be put into action. When we run up into what we call wicked problems, are these problems which are not so clearly defined, right? Um, we're so used to our smartphones now, and some of us will remember when the old form of telephonic communication we had was a wired handset at home with a dial and you push your finger in the button and you turn it to the number you want and so on. And we were fine with that because it was a means of quick communication, right? When you call somebody's home and the phone ring, 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 ring and nobody answers, you were fine with that. You hold the phone and say, okay, they don't reach home. I'm going to try them in half hour's time. No one clearly articulated and came out to say, you know, I need a phone that I can walk up and down with, right? However, through advancing technology and so on, engineers and scientists came up with the technology and said, hold on, here's a way in which we can untether the, the phone at home now and allow people to be mobile with their phones. And so the process starts and the iteration starts and they observe people and realize that people have needs. You know, it would be good now if we had a phone that can record your messages if people don't get you. So your, your mailbox was created. You know what would be good? If the phone could send a text message, people can read it. We'll put a screen on the phone and, and persons can read a message instead of us leaving a voice message. You know what would be good? If the phone had a bigger screen so that we can put a picture on it. But if we put in a picture, let's put a camera on it. No one really came out and said, I want a camera on my phone. To the point now where we have smartphones which really are mega computers in, in, in one sense of the word in that they're doing the processing that our computers do. They have replaced um, cameras. They have replaced so many devices and things that we used to use. And you know, we, we may step back and say, but hold on. I wonder which focus group they sat in and, told, and, and people told them they wanted all them kind of thing. Because the first time we would have encountered a smartphone with these features, it was like, yes, I want it. I never really thought about it, but thank goodness somebody thought about these features. And now I have a phone that have all these kind of things, right? So design thinking helps us to come up with solutions for problems such as this, as, as an example. Now, you may realize that design thinking may not be the answer to every problem out there. Some problems are very obvious, and so the solutions are very clear, right? However, it can enhance some of these more obvious ways of coming up with um, solutions. So rain is falling, we need an umbrella. That's an obvious solution. We don't need design thinking for that. However, if we have, let's call it an intelligent umbrella, that can sense the intensity of the rain so it knows how wide to open or how much to close up and it has a see-through panel on top so we can see the rain coming down or something like that. 
perhaps design thinking can help there, but you don't need design thinking necessarily to design the umbrella, right? Figuring out when to use and, and what areas to apply design thinking will come from some experience for the designer. Because once you have um, gone through the whole process of understanding how design thinking works, it literally becomes just a part of your everyday process and part of the routine that you use to generate solutions. So you will know how intense to use it, how um, when not to put too much time on it, and when to really um, delve into it um, deeply. And design thinking is not a one size fits all approach. And there may be variations in how you apply some of the tools, obviously. Um, so again, it comes from experience and depends on what it is that you're, you're, you're attacking you know exactly how to apply design thinking to your process. So I want to introduce you to another chart and another term which I alluded to earlier, where I said design thinking is very people-centric. Here we call it human-centered design as well. And here we're putting it in a context more from a business point of view, an entrepreneurial point of view. So if we look, we have three spheres here. In design thinking, we must think our, our solution has to be viable from a business perspective, right? Can we monetize um, what, 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 whatever solution we're coming up, right? And so this is a business sphere. We have to look at the feasibility of it. Can we build a solution? from a technological point of view, from an operations point of view. So I have this idea which seems viable from a business point, but can I make it? Can it be made in a way that um, will be able to satisfy demand? And the intersection between the viability and the feasibility is where you look at your service or process design. How do I design the process now um, so that I get my cost being optimal my um, output being at the point where I can satisfy demand and so on, so, and you look at that part of the design. Then very importantly, is my solution desirable? This is where the people person, the people component comes in now, the human component. Does my customer want this, right? And um, it's a problem here where really probably should be the, well, the problem from the customer perspective, right? But the solution in terms of satisfying that problem. But sometimes it goes even beyond just a customer wanting the problem. But does the solution work in the most optimal way for the um, customer, right? Now, in between the feasibility and the desirability, with the, at the human level is what we call functional design. Does it function as the way it ought to be? Give you a quick little scenario, case study. So I bought a new pot the other day, right? Because I decided I'm going to buy an induction cooktop, you know, latest technology in stove. It only gets hot in the area where you put the pot, but you need a special Steel, it will only work with stainless steel or iron pots. We we'll work with the aluminum pots. So I had to go out and buy a new pot. So I found this fancy pot set with clear glass cover and shiny metal all over the place. And I put this thing on the stove. And what happened? The handle gets hot. The, the lid, the handle on the, on the lid is hot. The handle on the pot gets hot. So now I have to find something to hold it. I'm like, why didn't, didn't make this pot? I wish I had known before, because there are some metal handle pots that have insulation between them that it doesn't get hot. I'm like, why didn't they make it that the handle doesn't get hot? So even though, yes, I, this is a solution for me, I want a pot, but is it the ideal solution for me? No, because it failed in, in, in that functional regard in, in terms of the handle getting hot where it, it, it poses a risk now if I didn't remember to um, get a um, mitten or what have you to hold it, then it would burn my, my fingers and so on. So you want to think through that process and see how your feasibility matches with 
the desirability. And of course, from a branding perspective, the business viability and whether people are going to be spending money on your solution and so on is where brand design or emotional design comes in to attract people to your thing. And this is where brand loyalty and people get attracted to particular names of, of um, products and services comes into play. So this whole relationship here, this, this Venn diagram speaks about um, human centered design. And right in the center here, the intersection of all three spheres, three sectors, is what they call the innovation trinity, or this is where design thinking kicks in. Because if you, if you can get the functional, the process design and the emotional design all coinciding and working together that you satisfy all three areas, then you would have done a good job from a design um, thinking perspective. So this is something that we pay attention to quite a bit when um, doing our, our, our investigation in coming up with solutions and so on. So here I have um, a five step approach. I mentioned earlier that one of the biggest companies driving design thinking as a philosophy in, in coming up with solutions is IDEO. And uh, um, the quote at the beginning was from Tim Brown who is the CEO of IDEO, but IDEO was actually founded by two brothers, David and Tom Kelly. David Kelly is actually an engineering professor at Stanford University, and Stanford is recognized as, one of the, as the originator of design thinking. So to kind of reinterpret the process again, they have this five-step approach which they use to, to um, drive solutions. And again, just reinforcing what I had earlier. So it's about understanding the market, the client and the technology and perceived constraints of the problem. So that understanding, that, that, that empathy has to be there before you take the next step. And what this is saying, you really can't design a solution for somebody if you're not in their situation, if you don't understand what they need. And it's not about you, it's not about your own perceptions, but it is what um, persons want. Then you observe real life people in real life situations to find out what makes them sick and what they respond to. And this, that's very important. So it, all the market research that you'd have done from a theoretical point of view or using other marketing tools, you still need to observe real people in real life situations, look at how they do things, look at how they respond to things and so on. Then you want to visualize concepts that will, 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 they will find useful, right? And how they impact um, person's response to them, right? So you want, and this is where your brainstorming is. And you go through your evaluation and refinement, your iteration, you, you create your prototypes and you go through the iteration to come up with a final solution. And then you implement your new concept for commercialization, which includes a whole bunch of things from having your business model correct, from having your, your production operations organized, have the financing in place, have the distribution channels, et cetera, et cetera, to hit the consumer on the shelf. Um, this process helps in doing that. Now, a few other things, characteristics about design thinking. It takes a lean approach and lean in the sense of being very um, adaptive, being very agile, being very quick. Um, we spoke about um, lean startups and agile startups, and, and there is a whole um, philosophy of lean manufacturing and, and, and lean business where you, you, you literally strip down and look at your minimum viable product and how you can get that to your your, your, your target audience using techniques that reduce waste, reduces time and cost, or keep those to a minimum, while ensuring that the key features of your product or your service gets across to um, your client in a, in a quick kind of way. So your validation has to be quick in order for you to move along. Applying lean thinking helps you to differentiate from your competitors because you're putting yourself in the 
the shoes of your, 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 your customers, then you know what they want. It allows you to be a lot more flexible in differentiating your products to meet um, the needs of your, your clientele. So the customer experience now becomes a key differentiator, much more than, than price, much more than specific features sometimes, and a lot of things. At, um, right now, persons are more into experiences than just acquisitions. Even when we buy something, it is about the experience. When you go to buy food, especially now, if you have to be lining up, if you have to do curbside pickup, it is about the experience more or just as much about getting your, 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 your grocery items or whatever it is. So how can you differentiate your product, your service, that your customers enjoy maximum experience so that they will keep coming back to you? They will give you feedback that you can e improve your, your, your service or your product even more, right? So lean thinking helps you to tap into that so that you can continuously improve your, um, your product for better customer experience. That experience obviously will lead to um, a higher customer satisfaction, right? You think about customer retention, but also attracting new customers, right? Because again, it is human-centered. It is about what your customers want, what people want, not you in a box thinking, this is what people want. I'm going to build it so you come and take it. But what do you want? How can I make my thing work for you? and so on, then customers will have that high level of satisfaction. They will be engaged to your product and they will bring more people. More people will see why others are attracted to your product and, be, um, and, and want to be a part of that experience as well. So it's very important that we look at this aspect and use design thinking for this particular purpose. So we look at um, why design thinking Let's go deeper now into some areas and see how we can apply design thinking in, in, in a real way. So I'm going to break down into four areas here and spend a little bit of time on each. So we start with design research. And if you remember that chart I showed earlier with the lines, the, the very confusing lines that eventually worked out into a smooth single line, this is taking us through that um, a bit. So design research. How do we, we get inspired? Where does inspiration come from? The synthesis part, which is where you now generate some of that. You, you, you define your, 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 the, 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 the problem some more to come up with insights and, and possible opportunities. Then we generate the ideas, brainstorming, um, prototype and testing. I'm not going beyond prototyping, you've seen in the model before, after prototyping in the ideal model, you would be um, testing. I'm kind of merging testing with prototyping in this um, particular situation so that we don't get too deep because of the time um, constraint that we, we may have. So when we talk about design research, what are we talking about now? As I keep saying, it is about empathy. Use empathy to understand the needs of people who will experience the product or service. This doesn't replace the other types of research that you'd be doing. So you'd be doing your market research just as much. You'd be doing research into the type of materials or processes that you need to um, use to make your, your, your product and so on. But this underlines now and, and helps you to define or, or, or put you on the right footing to do research. So your research doesn't lead you down roads or, or your research doesn't reap the kind of answers that you may need. So one well, of the first thing, and, and this is very serious research, observe and listen in context. This slide, this picture here comes from a workshop that IDEO did. And this shows that in doing research, the person realized that asking a person with arthritis to show us how they open their medication reveal design opportunities. Now, this looks like a, a meat slicer. You know those old meat slicers that slice your meat very thin on your vegetables and so on? 
this is what this person with arthritis has used to open his medication. Why? Because the bottle is so small, his fingers can't get a good grip and it's not very comfortable to do it. So he says, you know, if I use the, 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 the saw to kind of cut around the cap a little bit, then it can just pop off easier. Right? So when we talk about research and observing people, this is literally what it means. So you literally have to go into that domain where the user is in their personal space sometimes. Observe them, listen to them, but listen in context in terms of what are they trying to say? What, what, what challenges are they having? You know, boy, I have to take this arthritis medication, but I don't have anybody around me when, 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 when it comes to time for me to take it. And I can't open the bottle, no matter what I do. Oh, this thing works, so let me try it. Seems very risky, seems very dangerous if he hurts himself. But for him, this is the only solution. So we look at this now and we say, boy, oh, so when I'm designing a bottle of my wonderful pepper sauce and someone with arthritis may buy it. Hmm, could this be a problem for them to open it and they don't have anyone around? Hmm, how can I redesign the, 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 the cap or the bottle that my pepper sauce in? You don't have to be somebody with arthritis, um, taking arthritis medicine but you go in and you observe people sometimes just how, how they're doing. It could be your family members at home that you observe. It could be your friends. It could be your co-workers or it could be random strangers out there, right? So you want to observe and look. And, and obviously, you want to take notes of your observations. It's very important in, in design thinking, recording information. And um, we speak about interviewing people as well, not in a, in, a, in, in a traditional interview way, but in having that conversation with them and documenting their responses um, becomes very important. Look towards extremes is another form of research. So one day I followed some um, team members out to visit our Things Jamaican store at the Norman Manley Airport and in the parking lot I came across this motorcycle. I was like, hold on. Though. This all look like a normal motorcycle to me. Why is the back wheel so far away from the rest of the motorcycle? Showed some people and I said, oh, it's a stunt guy ride it. Right? He needs this extreme motorcycle to perform his stunts. In doing your research and trying to come up with a solution for a problem, look at extreme ideas or, or things which are out there and see how it may trigger again some kind of solution for something else right mm, maybe if we extend the seat and put something we can make it a multiple person bike oh the, but that may be unsafe if you have six people on this bike and you go around a corner and everybody fall off and hurt themselves but what can I glean from this extreme idea that someone is using and, and it works for them? You know, how can it function? So you want to look at extremes and see how it can generate other ideas for you. And you're on the research stage, so you write it down. Here is something that looks a bit different and, and works differently. So you want to try doing that. Look for analogous experiences. I'm sure a lot of us would have encountered this guy around town while in traffic going home. This fellow has a handcart that he has motorized. It has a motorcycle engine in there and he zips up and down in traffic. I, he's always intrigued me. So one day I woke him up at a gas station and I started questioning him. And yeah, he's a motorcycle engine there and he does it because it gets him around town very quickly and he can sell his wares. He sells like CDs and a whole bunch of stuff from the cart. And I said, boy, this is very innovative, man. Very ingenious. You, you, you really have something here, but why never put a seat on it? Ha, ha, ha. Why? This even put a seat on it now. The police have got to say it's a vehicle and I'm going to license it. But as long as I stand up, it's a cart and them can do me nothing. Right? But you can look at his experience now and say, okay, how can I, if I 
wanted to design a vehicle to handle Jamaican traffic. Now, we're much more flexible, much more, more, more um, utilitarian than a regular motor car. What can I do? I could look at his experience and, and look at how he did it. Does his solution work for me and the people I'm designing for, right? Um, who may not want a traditional motorcycle because they're afraid of riding on two wheels and falling off or someone knocking them off, off of the car, off of the bike. So you can look at experiences like this. So what I'm also saying to you, design thinking is something that is with you 24 hours a day around the clock. You learn to look at these ideas and these experiences and, and you bank them and say, how can they help me? You may not be able to use it right now, but down the road you'll remember, oh, you know, I remember once I saw this kind of thing and it works in that situation. Maybe I can pull this particular feature from that idea. You don't have to pull the full idea. Well, pull the feature from this idea to arrive at my solution, right? So research is something literally around you all the while and in what some people may consider mundane experiences or items, but they point always to some kind of solution that someone has. And even though it, design thinking is about designing for people and designing for others, looking at it from other perspectives, some of the solutions you get are from people who design for their own problem and they try to find their own solution because they can't go into a store and get that solution. So it, even though you want to look from other people's perspective, it can come from you, but it has to come from you in a real sense with a real problem you may encounter around your home, in your workplace, on the road, wherever, and you realize, hmm, this can work. But obviously you're gonna to have to test and validate that idea to ensure that there are others who may be interested in this solution. You want to immerse yourself, right? As children, we like to put on our, we used to love to put on our parents' shoes and pretend that we're big, we're grown now, and so on. Again, immerse yourself in the experience of others. Just like the slide before with, with, with the, the person trying to open the, the cap and they have arth extreme arthritis, put yourself in the situation. Test it yourself. Take the, the bottle from them and try opening it and realize, wow, it requires so much turning force to open, right? Put yourself in the experience of others as much as you can so that you can feel what they're feeling. You can respond the way in which they're responding. You use a product in the way that they use a product, right? Because one of the things designers fear the most is that you design something and someone says, but it can't work. It don't work the way I want. And you yourself even haven't even tried the design yourself. If you're designing something, look at others who are doing similar products. Go there and buy the product or, or, or get someone's products. If you're making and designing sandals, go out there and fit other people's sandals, walk in them, see how they feel, right? How does it compare to yours or what can you do? Why um, does someone buy a particular pair of sandals? Do they have problems with their instep? You know, you have a high arch or you have a low arch or something and after I stand up in the shoe after four to five minutes, your foot tired, right? What can I do to improve that and, and make that different so that it meets that customer satisfaction that we spoke about earlier? So we're synthesizing now. So we, 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 we're coming up with, with um, solutions and looking at opportunities now. So the observations that we'd have done in the research stage, you want to use those and, and the findings from these observations to, to gather insights and see how they can lead to opportunities or solutions. So again, I'm, I'm bought, I've borrowed some slides here again from IDEO, who are the gurus. So hope they don't come from uh, for IP breaches, but I give them them credit, right? Um, part of the synthesis now is for you to tell stories, right? So from what you have gathered from your research, you want to put down those thoughts on paper, whether graphically, or in, 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 in words, what stories come out of this, right? Um, what have I gathered from 
the experiences of others? What have I gathered from the experiences that I've put myself into? And you start to document it in the form of stories. Then from those stories now, you want to look for patterns and what they call tensions, where, where things are pulling. And you may see themes coming out. Hmm, here's a particular theme I realize, you know, because I look at so many people, I look at so many situations, and I realize that these are recurring themes or, or things that seem to be coming um, to the fore. How can those help me with my product? It could be about people's preference in color, people's preference in, in texture, people's preference with something that allows you to, 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 to operate a device or, or, or an item much um, easier, you know, but you want to be able to pinpoint and identify any kind of themes or recurring patterns that maybe um, that, that are coming to the fore that you can utilize in your solutions. Then from these themes and stories now, you want to go deeper and extract your insights, right? You want to try to define a message that sets the, the problem in a new light. What can I get from? What is all this saying to me? Ah, this is it. We need to have a bottle that someone with arthritis can easily use some other thing because your fingers hurt them so much to twist that you may want to have a flip open cap, but at the same time, the cap must be safe so that it doesn't flip open um, at the wrong moment and spill the contents of the container. How do we get around that? Right? So you, you pick up on these insights and then that will drive you closer to um, your, your, your solution. Of course, you may come up with more than one insight Right, you may come up with different avenues and channels in which you can take this, but you want to ensure that you come up with um, some workable insights and things. And then use frameworks, um, things like storyboards. Designers love to use storyboards and like to express themselves graphically um, using um, perception maps, mind maps, um, just charting these things so you can define your process. Um, you, you can define who is involved and so on. Put down a story, what, what, you know, say document these insights in a sequential way in, that will drive you to um, articulate your message clearer and so that when you come with a final solution, then you have a clear picture of where you're um, trying to go. So we're at the generating idea stage now. And the tool we use for this is brainstorming, right? And one of the things that I've learned about brainstorming and, and when I read about brainstorming, brainstorming has to be a routine thing for designers. And it has some structure. It has some form to it, even though it embraces a lot of things that would not be considered normal in, in, a, in, a, in a normal situation, I use normal in quotations as well. One of the things about brainstorming obviously is to have a whole lot of ideas and for you to defer judgment. There is no bad idea, right? In COVID-19 now we hear that we need to wear mask and face shield and so on. So here's this person, okay, let me fashion my own, not even face shield, a head shield from one of these big water bottles that we use, right? That's the solution. So if we're coming up with protective gear for COVID-19 and someone comes with this in a brainstorming session, you don't laugh at them. Even though we may throw this idea out eventually, but you put it in the pot and you consider it because this particular idea may trigger you in a different direction. So always defer judgment in your brainstorming session. And obviously a brainstorming session will mean you have to bring um, divergent minds as well. So you get different perspectives. Um, one of the things I always say about brainstorming, you don't want too much yes men or yes people in there who just agree with what, what everybody said. Yeah man, yeah man, that can work. Yeah man, that can work. You want people saying, okay, it's not a bad idea, but why would you come up with this idea? Why would you use this? And you, you drill holes in, in that. 
you also want to encourage wild ideas because you don't know what wild ideas may lead to. Um, this is a replica, it's not the real one or the actual one of Peter Tosh's M16 guitar. It was on display at the National Gallery. They had, had an exhibition of reggae music, which should have been going till July, but COVID kind of shut down that. So I don't know if it's up. If when it opened, I hope they still have it. So if you haven't seen it yet, I'd encourage you to go and see it. But who would have thought that a guitar could look like an M16? In Peter Tosh's mind, this guitar was to shoot Satan in him parts I won't mention right now, and so on. So it was like his musical weapon, right? So you want to encourage wild ideas like that in, 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 in a brainstorming session, how you can fashion your thing in, in a way that will get attention that may work, but you know, you want to throw in the wild ideas and the bad ideas and the good ideas and, and not so crazy ideas and so on. Put them all there. Then obviously you want to build on the ideas of others. So this is where all the ideas come together now because you may take piece from this idea, another piece from a different idea, and you put them together. And you see how they work, what, what other new idea they may generate from that, right? To lead you um, closer to the solution you're looking at. Even though you may be looking at all these divergent ideas and you come up with all these crazy thoughts and this is where brainstorming takes a lot of discipline now. You have to stay focused on the topic. Because sometimes we're brainstorming and one idea leads us down a road and we end up having a totally new discussion. You want to avoid that. You want to stay focused. Okay, what are we trying to solve here, folks? Hold on. And in a brainstorming session, it's always good. I do like to talk about when having brainstorming sessions is to have an adult in the room. You appoint one person as being the adult who you give them a whistle or a bell or something. And when they're just kind of getting too wide and too far away, they say, okay, folks, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let us come back. Let us bring it back to focus. Right? Of course, you want to be documenting your ideas and they suggest your number of your ideas as well. So you can refer to them in a, in, a, in a sensible and logical kind of way. You know, if we took aspects of idea number 13 and did something with idea 25, maybe we can have something, you know? So you, you, but you want to stay focused on topic and remain structured as much as possible in that broad sense when brainstorming. So those are just some of the key things um, to look out for while you brainstorm. There are other things, obviously, and brainstorming sessions normally are not very long, 45 minutes to an hour long. You break, you come back, because you don't want to get fatigued and then you start losing people, losing ideas, and you lose that creativity and so on. So it is suggested that you keep your brainstorming sessions to a manageable time. However, don't think that one or even two brainstorming sessions may lead to a solution um, in many cases, depending on what um, solution you're, you're trying to arrive at or what problem you're, you're tackling. So you may need several brainstorming sessions. However, you want to ensure that with each brainstorming session, you make some progress. You don't go back into a brainstorming session rehashing and going back over what you have done in the previous brainstorming session, you want to come back and ensure that um, we have moved forward, we have some information, and again, you document, you document, you document. Whether you're putting it on a whole bunch of sticky pads and putting it on a wall, or you have a big notebook, or you have a flip chart, but you need to put down all the ideas, all the thoughts, all the possibilities, from your brainstorming session. Now, your brainstorming session should drive you closer to this point now. Prototype. We're close to a solution. We know what we want. We've seen the picture now. Yes, this is what I want. We're getting there. So we're testing all of that. No, that all the concepts have been filtered and, and so on. So we want to test that. As I mentioned earlier, failure is a part of that. And prototyping, it is said, it embraces early fail so that you can succeed sooner. 
And it may, that may sound a little bit contradictory, but it's not. We figure in a lot of times that we, we're, we're making something. So I'm making a mask, right? Simple thing. I don't have no time for fear when I make the first mask. So I just make up two pieces of cloth and bam. So I'm out there very soon with it. I'm the first one to hit. But as we go along, we're realizing more things about this coronavirus, more things about PPE, how they function. You put it on your face, what happens if you have asthma, what happens if you have allergy to certain types of um, fabric and so on, and so on. So you may make the first mask and you think you've reached, but it really has failed because it doesn't meet all of the, the expectations. So you go back to the drawing board so to speak, or you'll, you'll go back a step in your process and you'll make some improvements, you iterate. So you have a better mask coming out um, and, and, and satisfy that. Now, prototyping can be very rough. It can go through a very rapid evolution and it will go through several iterations. Obviously, it depends on what you're doing, but your prototyping doesn't have to get too complex, too technologically innovative, um, you know, with, with a lot of high tech things behind it and so on, right? So here's someone designing maybe an app to use on a phone. How does it function? What was the user interface like? Okay, so let me just cut out piece of um, cartridge paper and scribble with a, with, a, with, a, with a mark on it, a Sharpie on it. I say, okay, this is the layout I want. This is how it go. When I swipe left, this is what happened. When I swipe right, that is what happened. So no coding was involved. No programming, no high tech, nothing. This is just the idea we're putting across. This is pro the first level prototype we're doing. Obviously, you'll have to do all that coding to test if it really works now and so on. But your prototype can be this simple. Now, in this operating theater, they have this device that is doing something. And so the designers who were asked to improve this, they realized the first thing was, wow, look at all these wires and tubes and hoses and look at how the doctor is holding the device. And he has two devices in his hand and he has to be doing some kind of procedure here. So they would have gone through the whole process of, you know, this is, is, is empathizing your, your, in the operating theater with the doctor. Wow, there must be an easier way to do this thing. And you go through the whole process and they come up with a prototype. Right? They want to have a device that is comfortable in the neutral hand position. You saw what they use? The regular whiteboard marker, what looked like a clothespin, this looked like a little film canister and some tape. And it illustrates exactly what it is that we want. Yeah, this is how it must look. This, so when I hold it in my hand, it feels this way. I'm not working with two devices and this finger overlap over there and this hand holding this item and so on. But it drives to a solution. So your prototyping literally just converts your, 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 your thought process, what you have on paper, into, in many cases, a three-dimensional representation. Doesn't have to be expensive, doesn't require specialized materials or equipment at times. But your prototyping could be a process. Again, you'll run a little grocery store and you're experimenting with curbside pickup. All of the one evening when you close the store and everybody gone home, you arrange um the space and you make somebody drive a car to and see how it works. How long does it take for them to pick up a bag of um, or two bags or three bags or what have you and so on and you drive through. Another example which I don't have here on a slide which comes to my mind is a scene from a movie called The Founder. I don't know if any of you have watched that movie. It's about Ray Kroc who he didn't start McDonald's. It was started by the McDonald brothers but Ray Kroc was a person who took it over from them, franchised and made McDonald's one of the biggest fast food chain in the world at the time. There's a scene in the movie where the brothers are conceptualizing their restaurant and they knew that they wanted to 
make a hamburger and deliver it to the customer in a particular um, period of time. So they literally went into the open lot before the building was, was put up, drew on the floor a big floor plan of the building. They marked out where the particular appliances would go, the stove, the oven, the fryer, etc. And they said, okay, you have to put this one first over here, this one here, that one there. So we move in sequence. And they went through that and that was their prototype. So when they built the actual space and put the thing in there, they tested it. And so they could build a hamburger in two minutes or whatever time it was. And in order to meet that, it had to take only three squirts of, of um, tomato ketchup, one slice of tomato, one leaf of lettuce, and bam, the burger done. So your prototype can take many forms. Um, sometimes we think that a prototype has to be expensive and it's a very in-depth process. But this only shows that you use what you have at hand. The key takeaway from prototyping is that you have a demonstration of your idea in a, in a tangible form or in a workable form as much as possible. Obviously this mark and this thing, car, your car, car going as operating theater now and, and doing anything to anybody but it illustrates what can be done. And ultimately, this is what it led to. All the hoses converge into one device and you have one probe and it can be held very, very comfortably, right? So your prototyping, again, is something that leads to um, a solution that is workable and it comes from all the other aspects of design thinking that allows you to pull them all together in one basket, so to speak, so that you have um, the solution. So I'm wrapping up now. And just to go over that design thinking is about the human being. It is user-centric and it is used to solve a myriad of problems. It doesn't have to be your traditional design problem in, in terms of making a widget for someone. It can solve a process. It can solve traffic on the road. It can solve um, all this bungling in supermarkets and at, at, the, at, at, at the various places where we go to get service. And wherever we see a problem happening, the principles of design thinking can be applied and they can lead to some solutions which are workable and you will find that even though it does not replace the, 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 the other hands-on aspects of design, it sort of leads to uh, more enlightened solutions and in cases it really leads you to a more um, efficient design, right? It can help to reduce cost in the long run because you would not make as many mistakes at the design or, or at the, the, the production step of, of the game. So it really helps in that regard, but it certainly does not replace it. It complements um, not just functional design, but process design and um, other areas that you may think of applying um, this, this particular philosophy to. Of course, it is a step-by-step -step process and repeated over several iterations in order for you to arrive at the ideal solution. And finally, design thinking is really about doing. It is something that you have to be involved in. You, you have to take yourself literally in the space um, that you're trying to find a solution for and put yourself among the people who you are designing for to get the solution that they need. So thank you very much. And um, Daniel, I'm now open for questions. Okay, thank you very much, Colleen. A very compelling presentation. And one of the main, well, some of the things that jumped out at me while you were presenting had to do with um, the functionality of um, whatever product that you are pursuing or that you are thinking about, as well as the customer experience. And then some errors that we definitely need to bear in mind are the documentation, as well as prototyping and um, brainstorming. And of course, we should always remember that the product does not have to be perfect. 
but we will change it or improve as we go along. So thank you very much. There were some really interesting points and I'm sure many of us did not realize that design thinking is in almost every aspect of what we do in our day-to-day -day activities. Definitely so, definitely. All right, so I'm just going to head on over. I saw that some, well, questions came in a little early and um, Anne Rich, she asks, it seems to have some elements of project management. What is your view on that? Oh, yes. Um, well, I'm answering a question. I'm actually looking for the chat button here. So poor me, no feeling. But yes. yes, it does have some elements of project management. Um, it, one of the beautiful things about design thinking is that it overlaps in so many areas, right? Um, it is a powerful management tool as well. It pulls upon certain principles of, of um, project management, especially when you talk about scheduling, right, and meeting milestones and, 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 and looking at your, your, your goals and so on. So yes, it does um, overlap with, with project management. It doesn't, again, replace any of these, uh, the, these particular um, tools or principles, but it certainly helps to enhance whatever area you are in. So if you're in project management, design thinking can help you to design more efficient projects, right? And you use your, your project management tools to um, implement in, a, in an efficient kind of way. Okay, all right, thank you for that. Also, Alicia Lindsay said, human-centered design seems to be another name for user-centric view in product design, product development, sorry. What is your view on that? Yes, you, well, design really has always been about finding a solution for the user. And the user obviously will be people, or in most cases. So, yes, it's the same. But however, the, the, the thinking about um, design thinking and human-centered design is that we go a little bit closer to the to specific humans almost in coming come up with, with solutions. Have you ever bought an item or gone somewhere? Let's start with an item first. Let me not mix them up yet. You have bought an item and you wonder who make this thing? Because this thing don't make no sense. Or um I'll give you an idea, a more practical thing. I'm left-handed, so I wear my watch on my right hand. And watches typically would have a stem where, where you, you, you set the watch. Right. And for years, all watches were made with the stem on one side only. So when I put it on my, my left hand, the stem would be on the inside and could, could get comfortable. Perfect design watch. It functions. It tells the time. You can set it with the buttons. Works as it was designed. But it was not built for left-handed people until someone decided, no, hey, let's make a watch for left-handers. So they move the stem on the outside so I can wear the watch comfortably on my right hand and it functions just the same as other watches, but now it's a little bit more functional for me and a little bit more comfortable. So even though product design has always been about and product development is about making something for people, bringing that human focus to it now allows you to come up with solutions which are more fitting to um, person's experiences. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for that, Colin. We have numerous comments that ha persons have been commending you basically for your presentation. I will jump to that after we have wrapped up the questions. But I have a question here for, for you from Ingrid Cook. She's asking... Would it be appropriate to say that design thinking is at core of at the core of all solutions? I would say yes. As I mentioned earlier, um, once you have a full understanding of the principles of design thinking, it almost at one level, at the base level, becomes automatic thinking for you. Right? There are situations where you need to apply it in a, in, 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 in a more defined and strict approach. 
but it does at the base level cover all aspects of life. If you go home and you're organizing your, your cupboard, you can apply some of the principles of design thinking because it's about what functions for you and those who interact with you in your space and who use your space. So how you arrange something. Um, and, and the funny thing about it, while, while, while I'm answering, I'm thinking of, of some practical things which really have been at the forefront of design thinking before it even probably was a term. Light switches, for example, and I don't know how many people realize this. A light switch, let's pick a light switch we see in our homes and stuff. The on position universally accepted is when the switch is up. And when it's off, it, it goes down, correct? Right. So when we get home and we turn on the light, instinctively our wrists go to the, 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 the light switch and we flick up. Right? That, because that came out of design thinking, but people in more industrial settings will tell you the reason why that is. Because when you have a switch that is in the on position up, if there is a situation where you need to cut the power easy, it is easier for your hand to go like this from up and bam, and turn off the light, than go this and turn it off. So it would have come out of that kind of thinking and it would have been transposed into our everyday use and we use it without thinking that, hmm, this is some design thinking applied here. So yes, it is something that literally is ingrained in our everyday life. Right, and again, it ties back into functionality. So whatever you're designing, whatever you're doing, it has to be functional. So when the average person gets it, it has to be practical for them to apply it. Even exactly. without thinking, just instinctively as just well. Instinctively. Exactly. And we as humans, that's how we're really wired, you know. We try to find the easiest way to do things. Sometimes we find it easy way and it is not the right way. But we tend to find the path of least, follow the path of least resistance and try to find solutions. Um, as an industrial engineer, one of the first things that, that, that taught me in school is about working smarter, not harder. Right. right. So again, that philosophy comes in, how do you find a way to work smart and not necessarily hard, right? And so you try to find solutions for, for that. So it does um, creep into a wide area of life. But we want to push this approach now for designers of both products and of services to not just go through the routine steps that you would have normally gone through in designing your product, but to kind of step back. You know, sometimes I say you can't see the forest because of the trees, or you can't see the trees because of the forest, whichever way the saying goes, right? But you want to step back a little bit and say, okay, yeah, see the tree there now, and this is how it works, and then you focus on that little aspect of it, trying to come up with a better solution. Okay. Our Ingrid Folk has also added, so design thinking maximizes slash optimizes functionality. Yes, it does contribute to it, to the optimization of functionality, right? And the thing about design thinking, even in optimizing functionality, it's a never ending story, right? Because the idea is that you keep looking even after the, the product has been launched or service has been launched, there is always room for improvement. The Japanese, I, I tell you, design thinking comes all across from the lean approach. In lean manufacturing, there is a concept called Kaizen, which the Japanese uses, which means continuous improvement. So even when you have something functioning the way how it has been designed to function, there is always room for improvement and for other people. And the beauty about Kaizen is that that improvement can come from anyone in the system, not just from the person at the top, but from the person at the bottom as well. Okay. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions currently. So I'm just going to head over to some of your commendations. Marilyn White has said, thanks JBDC and Colin, gotta go, but I'm grateful for the info. Now we can approach our game prototype with a fresh perspective. Definitely. Also, Faye Ellington has said, a very engaging and helpful presentation. 
Thank you. Hope has said, thanks, Colin, for a very pointed session on design thinking. And Judith Gale has also said it was very insightful. All right. I... Okay, Ingrid Koch has just said, excellent. And Anrich has added, thanks, Colin, for the new spin on this. It brought us, to, it brought us up to speed with its relevance in COVID-19. Definitely so. Right. Thank I'm not you. seeing any more questions. I'm not sure if any individuals would want to pose any more questions to Colin or we can just go ahead and wrap up. You were about to say something, Colin? No, I just mentioning that Deborah made another comment here. Very informative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah. Right. And as well, there's some more comments coming in. Thank you. And certainly, it's my pleasure to have presented this information to you. And as Dania will tell you, at JVDC, we're open. And even though we're connecting virtually with a lot of people right now, you know, we're here to share some more. And I certainly would like to engage more people and talk some more about design thinking. Because as much as I'm presenting, I learn so much more about design thinking every day myself and how we apply it and so on. Um, here's a last question, Dania. How do we test the market with findings that we have gathered? Right. From Lassine Matthews. No, this is where no design thinking Lassine would be integrated with your, your, your already um, proven and established methods of testing. So whatever you, 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 you use design thinking to glean and, and test and, and, and validate, then this is where you know, would integrate it with the other proven methods of testing within the market, doing your market testing and your market validation would now come in. What design thinking ought to help you to do now is to allow that process to be a lot more efficient and, and allow you to be able to pick up on insights some more so that you can respond to what the market is. So um, that's how you would really go about testing. Okay, and I see um, Ingrid Koch has asked for part two. Oh, yes. Well, okay, we can look at it with examples. Sure, I can look at putting together some case studies, some specific case studies of how design thinking um, have been applied. And what I can actually tell you about one right now that everyone can go home. It can be a little bit of a homework. Um, if you go to YouTube and search for IDEO, I-D-E-O, the deep dive, right? That's the deep dive. Then there's a video, and even though it was from about, I think, 1999, this is how long they have been at it. It is a, a breakdown of how they applied design thinking in redesigning a shopping cart, you know, the supermarket shopping cart. And it gives quite a bit of insight on their philosophy as a company and why they started using it and so on. And it illustrates perfectly some of the things I've been talking about in, in, a, in I think it's about a 20 minute video. There's a short version, but look for the long version, which is about 20 odd minutes. They have an eight minute version. But if you find that, if you can, then what I'll do, I'll search for it and then we'll find a way to probably post it posted the link with, within our own YouTube page so that you can see that video and um, that gives you an insight. But certainly what I'll do is try to put together part two so that we can talk about some other case studies. Yes, that would certainly be good. And uh, oftentimes we do get that request for part two as we did with convenient catering and we did answer that request with part two. Right. Okay, Faye Ellington, I said thank you, Colin. Most welcome, Faye, and most welcome to everybody. Thanks for the wonderful, positive feedback. Okay. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions right now, so I'm just going to go ahead and wrap up. I just want to thank everyone for attending the webinar today and for participating as well. And we Definitely want you to bear in mind that the JBDC is here to assist you with your business development needs and the technical services department is responsible for product development and as our head honcho pointed out today, 
we actually can cover some of the areas that um, you may want to consider design thinking and all of that to get your product to market. So remember that we offer consultation and that we also offer numerous services such as queue management, visual communications, um, support, as well as process flow uh, management and facility audits. We offer numerous services. We have incubators. So all you need to do is to contact the JBDC at info at jbdc.net, as well as any one of our telephone numbers, 876-928-516125, or JBDC's Incubator and Resource Center at 876-758-3966-8. So please don't hesitate to contact us to get additional information on any of these areas that you may have an interest in or to assist you with improving your business or product. We will be looking at another interesting topic next week. We'll be looking at fashion in the age of COVID-19. And COVID-19 seems like it will be with us for a period of time. So. We're definitely trying to prepare you in how you can deal with it going forward, especially within the various industries. Also, don't forget that you can check on this presentation and other presentations that you may have missed on our YouTube page at JBDC Jamaica. So all you need to do is to just visit that page, search for it, visit it. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the page and click on the notification bell to get any new alerts on new content that's posted on the page. So until next week, please be safe and we look forward to having you at our webinar. Same time, same place. Thank you very much.